And um, I'm especially grateful to Barry because he was courageous enough to come here the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And of course, he was delayed for about three hours at the airport in Pittsburgh. So thanks for taking the, the challenge. Um, Barry uh, received his uh, BA, or ABA, from Harvard College in chemistry and physics and then went to medical school, he did his MD and PhD at uh, Einstein. Uh, I think the PhD was in physiology and biophysics at Berkeley. Yeah. Um, one thing that his CV doesn't mention that impresses me most, that he did his, in, in addition to all that, he did his masters in nothing else but Hebrew literature. <laughs> so that's remarkable. In addition to, uh, uh, his uh, research, I think many people here have read about Long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, a lot of those hereditary mutation related arrhythmias. Uh, Barry is, a, is an outstanding clinician and he heads the division of uh, cardiology and also the Institute for Cardiovascular uh, Research at the University of Pittsburgh. So, so thank you very much, Yaron, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, back to St. Louis. I have many good memories of St. Louis. One of my college roommates um, was here, and I remember I, um, canoeing down rivers in the summer, um, you know, when I was in college. And you know, this is a great place. And thank you for letting me come back. Um, anyways, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, both some of the inherited arrhythmias, and then a little bit about you know the more common arrhythmias that we see in patients with high failure. Um, I'd like to start with this, with a story. So this story now dates back about 20 years. This is the cardiogram of a 15-year-old girl um, who presented at to Children's Hospital in Boston with syncope. She had absolutely no medical history, um, was a healthy young kid who played sports. Um, she was sitting by the pool in Newton, Massachusetts on one warm summer day when her brother, who was slightly younger than her, uh, came up behind her and scared her by pouring cold water on her head. Um, her response to that was to faint, and she was out for about half a minute and then woke up feeling fine. Her parents brought her to Children's Hospital, and in those days, for those of you who are clinicians, you know, in the modern generation, there weren't necessarily particularly senior people manning emergency rooms. And so she came to the in the evening, and um, she saw it was seen by a resident, who heard the story and got this cardiogram and uh, called the cardiogram normal. Now, for those of you who are EKG aficionados, you know, you can look at it and you notice that the QT interval is actually a little maybe on the long side of normal, but um, that wasn't appreciated at the time. Um, so he, you know, basically did everything, a workup, and said, you know, I think you're fine. But he thought the story was interesting enough. They said, well, I'm going to put a 24-hour hold the monitor on you just to see you know, whether this was to make sure that you're not having any rhythm problems. Um, this is the control tracing from the whole demonic. <coughs> and you can see that she actually has a QT interval on this at 600 milliseconds. So it's sort of really remarkably prolonged. But anyways, he sent her out and he gave her a diary and said, you know, if anything happens interesting, write it down in the diary. So the next day her dad brought back the Holter monitor and the <laughs> diary. And there was a single entry in the diary at 3.30 a.m. And the entry was nightmare. And that's the rhythm that was associated with her nightmare. And you see this classically, torsade de point, or ventricular tachycardia with a rotating axis, sort of looks like a sine wave type of pattern. And a couple things that this brings up. Um, one, um, did the nightmare cause the rhythm, or did the rhythm cause the nightmare? I'm not exactly sure. And number two, who had more nightmares, her or the resident who sent her out, you know, with <laughs> nothing but a whole monitor? And, you know, that's also a, a separate question, neither of which we'll ever have the answer to. But she has hereditary long QT syndrome, ultimately <coughs> found to have a mutation in the potassium channel of her that caused it. And so she has one of the inherited arrhythmia syndromes, and this list continues to grow on a probably monthly or bi-monthly basis. Um, 
you know, includes long QT syndrome, short QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, and which we're going to talk a lot about this is what remains uh, the disease, my lab studies. Right ventricular dysplasia, where you have rhythm problems and structural heart problems with right greater than left um, heart failure. Uh, some familiar forms of common conditions like atrial fibrillation and um, uh, conduction disease and wolf pox and white syndrome and catecholinergic polymorphic CT, and there's been a number of other of these um, inherited syndromes, you know, that have been described largely based on EKG characteristics because that's what we have to measure. Um, just a couple of words on how all these things work for those of you who might have forgotten cardiac electrophysiology and don't really want to remember it, and I promise not to spend very long. Um, so all our cells are little batteries, negatively charged inside, positively charged outside, that's because there's a sodium potassium pump in the membrane pumps uh, potassium in, sodium out, so intracellular sodium, potassium, 140 millimolar blood potassium is about 5 millimolar, um, opposite gradient to sodium. You then put channels in the membrane that are permeable only to potassium, potassium flows up down to concentration gradient, 140 to 5. Eventually the inside becomes negatively charged enough to inhibit bulk membrane flow of potassium. If you can figure out the equilibrium point from the Nernst equation, you plug in 140 millimolar and 5 millimolar, it will give you minus 90 millivolts, which is the resting membrane potential of most of the cells in our body. If you're a liver cell, you live your entire life at minus 90 millivolts until your pulse goes out drinking, at which point you die and you go to zero millivolts, and that's the life of a liver cell. If you're a heart cell, a skeletal muscle cell, a nerve, a nerve cell, you use changes in membrane potential to signal. And, you know, the, the change, which is called natural potential, and in the heart, these are about three, 400 milliseconds long. And you raise your potential from minus 90 to plus 20 by closing potassium channels, opening sodium channels. You then, you also open calcium channels, and calcium rushes into the positive charges go in. If you want to repolarize and terminate your active potential, how do you do that? You close the sodium channels and the, the calcium channels, and you open a new set of potassium channels. The action potential you know, becomes the surface representation of the EKG, so the P wave is the spread of activation across the atrium, the QRS, the spread of activation across the ventricle. So the middle of the QRS complex is when part of the ventricle is in having its action potential at plus 20, the other part still at minus 90 because it hasn't been activated yet. There's then an isoelectric period of the uh, EKG when all the cells are depolarized in the ventricle, and then the T wave represents the non-simultaneous repolarization of the ventricle. So these inherited arrhythmia syndromes, let's take long QT syndrome, your QT interval is too long. Why is that likely? Um, probably because your action potentials are too long. Why would your action potentials be too long? Well, maybe you can't open these potassium channels that repolarize you, they're broken, or you can't close the sodium or the calcium channels that are up here. And that is the molecular basis of the vast majority of long QT syndrome. And these are the genes, largely described by Mark Keating's lab, although a few by others, that cause long QT syndrome. They are the major repolarizing currents, late repolarizing currents of the heart, IKS, which is an alpha subunit KBL QT1, four copies of this one, and somewhere around two copies of the beta subunit min K. HERG, which is the second um, major <coughs> polarizing late current of the heart, IKR, which, so these are, we describe most of the genetically known long QT syndrome. And then there are relatively infrequent mutations in the sodium channel that cause it to not inactivate or not turn off. Um, some calcium channel mutations, that also cause long QT syndrome, but also cause syndromic disease. And then a number of beta subunits or accessory proteins to either sodium <coughs> currents, sodium channels, or potassium channels. So these are, so, and these describe much, but not all, of long QT syndrome. So if you show up in an emergency room with long QT syndrome and somebody sends you off for genotyping, there's about a 60% chance that a mutation in one of these genes will be found and a 40% chance that a mutation won't be identified. And we'll talk a little bit about why that may be later. Now, how important are these inherited arrhythmia syndromes? And the answer is, from a public health point of view, they're important, but not nearly as important as the common cause of sudden death. Um, arrhythmias and sudden death kill 
250 to 400,000 people a year in the United States. These inher the inherited syndromes are tenfold to 30-fold less than that. Most of the um, arrhythmias are associated with patients who have structural heart disease. Um, they, either people who are having a heart attack, had a heart attack in the past, or have a dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. We've learned a huge amount about electrophysiology through these inherited arrhythmias, relatively rare inherited arrhythmia syndromes. And I'm going to talk about one of them, Brugada syndrome, for the first part of the talk. And then for the second part of the talk, I'm going to ask the question, can we try to use genetics to learn something about the more common types of arrhythmias that happen in the setting of things like heart failure? So I'm going to talk about Brugada syndrome. And just a quick clinical description of what Brugada syndrome is. It's rare, and we can argue whether it's one in 10,000 people or one in 100,000 people or one in 5,000 people. It depends really how you define it. But it's rare, characterized by an EKG pattern that's pathognomonic, which is a right bundle branch block pattern with ST elevation in the right precordial leads of the EKG. So it leads B1 to B3. Looks like you're having an anterior myocardial infarction with a right bundle branch. The EKG pattern is not necessarily <coughs> stable, so one day you can have a normal cardiogram, or almost normal, the next day you can have a Brugada pattern. It is male predominant, although not X-linked, meaning that genetically women are less likely to have as men, but about 80% of the clinical cases are male, um, in terms of meaning that being male makes you more likely to have the condition as opposed to being female as protective. Classically, people have no structural heart disease, although that's not always true presents, like all the inherited arrhythmia syndromes, fainting, sudden death, sometimes seizures, um, also sometimes as um, sudden infant death syndrome, because uh, if you have sudden death as a baby, you get labeled for that. And it's most common in Southeast Asia, actually Northern Thailand, where it's the most common cause of sudden death in young men. Why is it so common there? Probably there was some guy 10,000 years ago who had the condition and had a lot of kids and <laughs> populated the region. Now, um, it's led to some interesting things in some of the villages in um, Thailand. So one of them that's particularly notable is it's male predominant. And in families where this runs, the men will dress up as women before they go to sleep at night on the hope that that will fool whichever god or goddess it is that takes them out. Now, I'm unaware of any randomized trials to close any efficacy for that, but my guess is probably doesn't work all that well. Um, so, so autosomal dominant uh, pattern of inheritance, which means if you have it, there's a 50-50 chance you'll give it to your kid, and you've probably got it from one of your parents, unless you're a new mutant. Um, early on, it was identified that sodium channels were important, and that's because sodium channel block is propionamide in the United States, flecainide, uh, which is no longer really available, and ashmaline in Europe, exacerbate the EKG um, phenotype, and actually are used as a diagnostic test to bring out the EKG pattern to see if you have it. Um, it's associated with conduction disease, uh, prolonged HD as well if you do an EP study, and inducible V-fib on, an e on program stimulation during an EP study. Um, and at the moment, the only proven treatment is a defibrillator in people at high risk of sudden death, although quinidine has been suggested, and, and that will be obvious why based on the, the, the mechanism. So what is the mechanism by which this causes disease? Well, if you remember, I told you long QT3 or long QT7 <coughs> can be caused by sodium channels that don't close properly. Well, this is the opposite. This is inadequate depolarizing sodium current, or sodium channels that don't open, sodium channels that don't open properly. So about 20% of the cases of Brugada syndrome are shown to be loss of function mutations in the sodium channel, the cardiosome channel um, SCN5A. And Dr. Insolovich's lab came up with the uh, medicine, the mechanism by which this happens. And you get re reduced depolarizing current in the epicardium of the right ventricle where the transient outward current is very large. That leads to loss of the active potential plateau, so very short action potentials in part of the heart while the rest of the heart has really long action potentials. And that inherently unstable leads to current flow, which causes the ST elevation on the EKG and the potential for initiating re entry arrhythmia. This is just a schematic showing normally the epicardial action potential is shorter than the endocardial or M cell action because there's more uh, transient outward current in the epicardium. Normally that 
doesn't lead to much on the surface EKG. But if you have inadequate depolarizing sodium current, you then end up with a boarded action <coughs> potential in the epicardium, leading to some cells that are fully um, repolarized while depolarization is still going on. You can therefore get internal reactivation of phase two reentry, leading to the uh, potential for arrhythmia. <coughs> this is a list of the genes that have been identified to date as causing Brugada syndrome. I will point out that most of them are ion channels, and these make up about 25 to 30 percent of the cases of Brugada syndrome. So the question is, what are the other 70 percent of the cases of Brugada syndrome? And the answer is we don't know. And why is what we have identified ion channels? And the answer is because that's what we've looked at. <laughs> so if you think about it, these inherited arrhythmia syndromes make sense that they're caused by mutations in ion channels. You know, they show up as changes in electrophysiology to high. So with long QT syndrome and Brugada syndrome and the other inherited arrhythmia syndrome, we look in ion channels and what do we find? Ion channels. But what happens if a large fraction of the disease is caused by something else? And then the issue is we have to try to figure out what that is. And one of the ways to do it is through positional cloning in large families. And our group identified sort of a non-ion channel that causes Brugada syndrome, the second gene initially identified for Brugada syndrome. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did it and what the mechanism is. So this is the EKG of the proband of our family. 55-year-old mm -hmm. guy lives outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. No medical history, no family history of significance, really. You know, sort of a healthy guy was eating lunch one day with a colleague of his and fainted into his egg salad sandwich. He um, was taken to the emergency room. They did a cardiogram on him. This is the EKG. And they noticed ST elevation, the right bundle, was the lead V1 to V3 with a right bundle branch block pattern. And they said, my God, man, you're having a heart attack. And he <laughs> said, I don't have chest pain. And he said, no, it doesn't matter, you need a cath. So they took him to the cath lab, and he had squeaky clean coronary arteries. They did an echo on him. He had a normal echo. They did a stress test on him. He had a stress test. They did enzymes on them, they were normal. And they weren't sure, but they note, noted the pattern was abnormal. And they called us, the head of clinical electrophysiology, I met Pitt, a guy named Kelly Anderson at the time, and said, you know, that maybe he has right particular dysplasia. Um, could you guys get an MRI on him? We don't have an MRI scanner up in the area. And Kelly read the literature, and this was back in 1996, and it was the first report by um, Joseph and Pedro Brugada um, was from 1992, and it was a case series of about a dozen people with sudden death or aborted sudden death in this EKG pattern. And um, Kelly had read that paper, which was in a relatively obscure electrophysiology journal, and said, no, 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 I, that's this thing that was described by these two guys. Have him come down here. And he said, send a couple of his kids with him, because in the original report it was sometimes familial. So he came down. Mm -hmm. Um, the program came down with a couple of his kids. His kids had the same EKG pattern, you know, as he did, and you know, um, was seen by a young electrophysiologist, co electrophysiologist, what it was. Um, so Raoul called me, and I did not do molecular genetics. I've never done positional cloning. Not a geneticist by any stretch of the mind. As a mouse geneticist, maybe not a human one, and you know. But, you know, I mean, how often do these rare inherited arrhythmia things that are relatively undescribed walk in your door? So I went down and talked to the proband. And if you're looking to identify new genes in these families, you need a big family. Because really, you need about, especially back then, you need at least 10 affected people to be able to go on a hunt for a gene. So I remember going down, down to the electrophysiology clinic and meeting with the proband saying, well, do you have any brothers or sisters? And he said, 11. <laughs> That's good. Where do they live? And he said, well, seven live on my street. And I said, well, that's really good. So I um, actually took a van up to Erie with an EKG machine and had eight affected people, you know, a week later. So, you know, and thus began the story. But before I get to that, clinically, what do we do with this guy? So this is a guy who shows up with a single fainting episode, 55 years old, has this EKG pattern, a relatively undescribed clinical syndrome at the time. And Raul um, said, you know, I think you should probably have a defibrillator. And the 
who had a patient agreed, and he got his device, and six months later he was riding, fortunately not driving, down to, um, for a follow-up appointment with us, and had two sinkable events in the car. And those are the electrograms from his two, one of his two sinkable events, showing very rapid polymorphic DT degenerating into DF, both fixed by a single shock, by each by a single shock. So this is one of the problems with these inherited arrhythmia syndromes that I want to point out, that, and one of the things that we clearly don't understand. This is, it's now 14 years later. This guy's had no further events. He has a defibrillator. We know he's had not had enough of an event to even register on his device as being an event. So in 65 years, or 70, almost 70 years now, this guy had one syncopal event when he was 55, two near sudden death events when he was 55 and a half, and absolutely nothing else. He clearly has a substrate for something bad, but there are clearly triggers. What is it? You know, was it the egg salad sandwich? Was it something else that actually triggered his you know, sort of clinical events, and then huge periods of absolutely nothing clinically. Makes it really hard to study them, so, you know, sort of these things. This is his pedigree. He is the youngest of a large, multi-generational family. A couple things you can see from the pedigree. Squares are guys, circles are girls. Filled in means clinically affected. So, most of the affected are men. There's one clinically affected woman, and she has a borderline EKG, but we know she has it because two of her kids you know, the two of her sons clearly have it. Second thing to notice in this pedigree is age dependent. This generation is 55 to 70 years old here. There's a bunch of affected people. This generation is 20 to about 50. There's a few affected people. This generation is up to 25. There's no affected people. Yeah. So in this family, it's clearly age dependent. The phenotype, at least, is clearly age dependent. This is just the clinical characteristics of the first 10 out of 11 affected people that we came. Some, like the proband, had an EKG that is always affected. Others had some EKGs that look affected, some EKGs, not so much. Um, some had syncope, no sudden death, which is good. Um, echoes showed mitral valve prolapse that tracks with the disease. So in this family, it's not pure electrical. There's also a mild structural defect. Not two of them have gone to mitral valve replacement, so not completely mild. Um, MRIs were basically normal, and drug testing in this family did not work. In other words, we've drug tested a lot of people, both affected and unaffected, and usually got nothing. Occasionally had in the affected people that EKGs that got a little bit worse with procainamide. Uh, the proband managed to get two drug tests. One was clearly positive and one was clearly negative. So um, sort of tough to explain sort of that, but the drug testing doesn't always work. <coughs> we went ahead and did molecular um, positional cloning to look for a new gene. We sequenced the sodium channel gene and it wasn't, the, um, there were no mutations in it. Um, we also did linkage to the sodium channel gene and it does not link to that gene. So what linkage analysis is, you're looking for a piece of DNA that's shared by all the people who are affected and is not shared by the people who are not affected. So if you have enough people in the family, if you can find something that statistically limits the area of interest, you know, if you think of D uh, by DNA as three billion base pairs, a book with three billion letters, and the, these genetic mistakes as one typo in that book, you can limit it down to a chapter by finding one chapter of the book that's shared by everybody who has the condition. And we found such an area on chromosome three. Um, and we then, is by <coughs> mapping and limited to about 900,000 base pairs of DNA. Now, we were lucky because the Human Genome Project happened to finish right about the time we got to here. So we could just go online and print out that 900,000 base pairs of DNA along with an annotation that describes all the genes that were in that 900,000 base pairs and all the putative genes. So the Human Genome Project not only identified where known genes were and what the code was, but also looked at things and said, you know, this looks like a gene because it looks like some other gene, okay? And so we prioritized genes. There were about five genes in there that were expressed in the heart and were perfectly reasonable candidates, and none of them had mutations. Um, and then there were a bunch of putative genes. So we went through and looked and saw whether any of the putative genes were actually expressed in the heart. 
and two of them were, and one of the two turned out to have a mutation and be the causative gene. And that was something called GPD-1 alpha, or glycerol free phosphate dehydrogenase 1 light gene. Not a great name. Why was it named that? Because it looked like glycerol free phosphate dehydrogenase 1. Um, it's 4,000 base pairs, 351 amino acids, 8 exons, had no function, known function. It was a putative gene only. 84% homologous at the amino acid level to GPD-1. So really very close to GPD-1. Um, and GPD-1 is an NAD-binding redox gene that plays a role in energy metabolism. It's really important for your slime mold. And it is thought in humans and larger animals to be important in tumor growth, apoptosis, osmoregulation, regulation, energy production. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, again, it has a predicted NAD binding domain and is a predicted membrane binding domain at the end terminus and at the dimer. The mutation we found was an exon 6. Um, you can see here on the color uh, amino acid uh, nucleotide gram that there's a um, C to T base pair change, which leads to an alanine to valine switch of conserved mutation but in an amino acid that in every form of GPD and GPDL, you know, in all species is always an alanine. It linked to the phenotype perfectly. We looked in a lot of controls. Um, we did 300, the reviewers said that's not enough. We ended up doing 500 people and could not find anybody um, else with that uh, variant. Um, and I mentioned the conserved gene family. We then went back to the pedigree and looked to see who our gene carriers so every affected person was a gene carrier. And now you can see a bunch of gene carriers in the second generation and in the third generation. And also you can see a few years have gone by, and now we have more affected people in the second generation and the first affected person, you know, clinically affected person in the third generation. By the way, let me digress for a second for those of you who are clinicians. So you have a big family like this, and you know that they have Brugada syndrome in the family, and people occasionally faint. So when somebody in this hundred and some odd person family fainted, um, what do you think the response of the elect their local cardiologist and then electrophysiologist was? The response was, mm, you might want a defibrillator, okay? So in this family, six people got defibrillated. They included three people with the gene and three <laughs> people without the gene. Um, of the people with the gene, included one brother who's had a run of very rapid ventricular flutter that self-terminated just before the defibrillator shocked him. Um, it's about a 30-beat run of very fast beat flutter. And another person who's had no symptom, nothing on his defibrillator to date, and that's the son of the Gobind over here. Um, the other three uh, have had nothing, which is obviously good. One has had his device explanted despite some objections from the Cleveland Clinic where it was put in. Um, and the other two are waiting until their battery runs out, at which point they will probably also have their device explanted. So, and that's, that's a, one of the useful things potentially about actually being able to identify the gene. We can tell people, <coughs> some people, that they really have nothing to worry about and they should not go ahead and get a defibrillator when they have fainting spells, which this family had a lot of basovagal fainting in it. So reasons that probably just to torture them. Um, so this is just a schematic of the gene, uh, NAD binding at the end terminus, um, along with a membrane binding <coughs> to the region. Catalytic site for the enzyme, we'll talk about what it does in a minute here, and the mutation a little bit of a distance from the active catalytic site. Um, RNA, northern blot showing expression in the heart, but also in skeletal muscle and in some other organs. Um, protein <coughs> blot, this just overexpressed protein in the cell line. Uh, these are hex cells. Hex cells actually have GPD-1 out in them, <coughs> and that this is this signal here. Rabbit, and the mouse gene um, it is three amino acids long, and you can see that, in fact, the blot shows the band goes a little bit longer, a little bit higher. Um, so then the question is, how does it work? So we were sort of took the simplest approach, and we said, well, maybe this thing <coughs> be some sodium current. So we took uh, hex cell lines that either constitutively or transiently expressed the sodium current gene SCN5A, 
um, they make inward sodium current. If you give them extra wild type GPD 1L, remember the cells have some GPD 1L already, doesn't affect anything. If you give them mute, the mutant, you decrease sodium currents by about 50%. And this is just an IV curve showing about a 50% decrease in sodium current when you give mutant GPD 1L, when you infect or transfect cells with uh, mutant GPD 1L. Um, did not change ch kinetics of the channel at all, suggesting that this is a change in channel number as opposed to a change in channel properties. As a control, we used, did the same experiments on the skeletal muscle sodium channel, SCN4A, and GPD-1L mutant does absolutely nothing to skeletal muscle sodium current. So it's, the effect is specific for the cardiac sodium <coughs> channel. We then went and looked and asked the question, does this change localization of anything? So we went ahead and either stuck GFP, green fluorescent protein, on the C-terminus of GPD-1L, or we just did immunofluorescence with antibodies to GPD-1L. And the wild type GPD-1L, you can see some of it is associated with the membrane. The mutant is not. So this ruins, the mutation screws up the membrane localization of GPD-1L. And it does the same thing with the sodium channel. Um, if you look at the sodium channels in a cell line, you can see some of them are intracellular because there's these are cells massively overexpressing SCN5A. But if you look at, if you quantitate the amount that's near the membrane versus the amount after you add the mutation, you get about a 50% decrease in sodium, in sodium channel um, immunofluorescent signature. And if you don't believe that, you can do biotinylation to biotinylate the surface proteins and then quantitate the amount of membrane GPD-1L given wild type versus mutant channel, a uh, mutant um, GPD-1L, and you can see there's a, about a 60% decrease here too in surface sodium channel. So it looks like GPD-1L is causing a surface trafficking problem. Now, that's in hex cells massively overexpressing, you know, SCN5A and now GPD-1L. How about in a more physiologic system? So we repeat it in rat neonatal uh, cardiac myocytes that it were infected either with a virus containing wild type GPD-1L or the H2ADV mutant. And you can see the same 60% decrease in sodium currents in cells that get the mutant. Here there was a subtle change in kinetic <coughs> power parameters of steady state activation and steady state inactivation, suggesting that maybe it doesn't just affect trafficking or cell number, but maybe does something to the channels too. And then the question is, what's the mechanism? And I'm going to show you two mechanisms that have <coughs> been published, and let me tell you in advance, they're both wrong, okay? The first one was done by Mike Rupel and by Sam Dudley, who we collaborate with, who at the time was at Emory and is now in Chicago. So this is an NAD binding redox gene. So the first thought is, maybe this is changing sodium currents because Sodium currents are NAD dependent, and there's a redox dependence NADH NAD current. So what Sam did, we did, was we went and looked to see whether NADH and NAD affect <coughs> sodium currents. And you can see if you have NADH, you have smaller sodium currents, and if you have NAD, you have bigger sodium currents. And it's true whether you put it intracellularly or extracellularly, and it gets intracellularly when you do that. And you know this is just intracellular data, extracellular data, showing that sodium counts appear to be NAD and NADH dependent. And if you give cells the mutant, they end up with, and then you measure NADH and NAD, you find that the cells that got the mutant have more NADH, which would then predict that, based on the prior scheme, that they would have less sodium count, which goes in the, which would explain it. And so this is just a schematic of how this might work if GPDL, this is a reaction to catalyze DHAP plus NADH to glycerol 3 phosphate and NAD plus. If you have less and GPD1L, an inactive mutant, for example, you'd expect buildup of NADH, which would then give you the phenotype. And Sam's group went a little further and showed that it was PKC and reactive oxygen species dependent to have the effect of NADH. That's what we published about a year ago in some research. Um, John Nikelski's group at Wisconsin, at about the same time, published a paper in AJP with an alternate mechanism. Their mechanism goes something like this. If you have 
an inadequate or a broken GPD-1L, you will the, the reaction catalyzed G3P to NADH bonds to NADH and DHAP. You'll get buildup of glycerol free phosphate. By the way, please note that our mechanism was this direction as the major way it worked. Theirs is the opposite direction. Both are supported by the literature. Obviously, both may not be so But you get glycerol free phosphate that then goes through and ultimately activates PKC, which um, decreases sodium Yeah? The biochemical evidence of purified GPD1L does actually work with the GPDH? Um, yes. And with uh, flu ox, and I, I may show a slide in a second. If it's so you made it in bacteria? In We've made it in bacteria, and um, both purified protein and sort of overexpressed larvae, the cells overexpressing it. So it, it actually is active. We um, haven't compared its activity level yet with GPD with the same protein concentration. So this is their mechanism. And they went so far as to show that if you mutate the amino, one of the amino acids that is PKC phosphorylated, you can eliminate the effect. So the two mechanisms are not both mutually exclusive, but note they suggest that you have the opposite direction of this reaction. And also note that they both go under the assumption that the mutation is less active, okay? So to try to see whether that was true, we then <coughs> said, okay, well, let's get rid of gpd one out cells, hex cells have GPD-1 in them, so one of my um, students did a knockdown. So this is an siRNA knockdown of GPD-1L, 86% decrease in expression of GPD-1L, and when you decrease GPD-1L in native cells, you get more current, not less, okay? How about if we make some real mutations? So we made some dead mutants. We either took out, we either deleted the NAD binding site, put a mutation in an essential amino acid in the NAD binding site, or mutated the catalytic site enzyme, you know, in the enzyme, you know, the catalytic site of the enzyme, so that it's dead. This just shows um, activity. The wild type is reasonably active. The mutant is a little less active. Our dead mutants are reasonably dead, as you would expect. If you infect or transfect cells with these dead mutants, you get more current, just like in the siRNA knockdown. So clearly, decreased activity of this thing isn't the answer to how this works. So we said, okay, um, let's try to figure <coughs> out what the protein is doing. So we went ahead and did a yeast 2 hybrid to try to figure out what other proteins this thing is binding to. And we did it under high strength C and got two hits. One was GPD-1L, so it picked itself up, which makes sense because it's a dimer, and this sort of helps confirm that it's a dimer. And the other thing we picked up is GPD-1. GPD-1 is a cytoplasmic protein that is expressed also in the heart, and mm -hmm. looks like it can co-assemble with GPD-1L. And so then the question is, so what's actually happening? The single biggest finding that we have is that GPD-1L, the mutant, no longer localizes at the membrane, but now goes into the cytoplasm, which is normally the focus of GPD-1, not GPD-1L. So <coughs> we hypothesized that maybe what's happening here is that the that GPD-1L is supposed to be at the membrane and creates <coughs> a local microenvironment around the sodium channels that then gets mucked up when the mutation is there. So this is just an early version of a slide. So this GPD-1L, which is supposed to live around the membrane, GPD-1, which is cytoplasmic, and by the way, mitochondria have another analog of this GPD-2. And all of these catalyze the same reaction. So the question is, if you take mutant GPD-1L, which is still active, and now flood the cytoplasm with it, this probably either by leaving this behind, or more likely by doing something with GPD that it's not supposed to, may be ultimately leading to the downstream event, maybe by one of the mechanisms that either Dr. McKelsey's group or our group actually postulated might be true. Um, and we're still working on it. Um, how are we going to get at it? Well, we have um, GPD-1L knockout mice, both global and cardiac-specific mice, that should be available for study sometime in the next couple of months. Um, we've made overexpression transgenics that don't have 
all that much of a phenotype at the moment, and we're continuing to, to work on sort of other potential ways of getting at sort of the mechanisms, which I can talk about more people in the next episode. But, so anyway, so just to summarize this part of the talk, gp one l is a novel sodium channel modifier. Mutations cause Brugada syndrome by decreasing the sodium current. Um, I didn't mention it, but other mutations cause sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, Dr. Ackerman identified a few of those um, at Mayo Clinic. gp one l appears to alter sodium channel trafficking. The mechanism is still not completely known. Clearly, proteins associated with GPD-1L are novel candidates for Brugada syndrome. We've looked for GPD-1 and not found any mutations in it so far. And identifying novel arrhythmia genes, you know, hopefully will expand our understanding of arrhythmia mechanisms and of cardiac electrophysiology. This is a gene nobody had any clue had anything to do with cardiac electrophysiology and that nobody would have ever looked in as a potential candidate for Brugada syndrome. Um, and could this be important in one common arrhythmias too? Don't know yet. Um, and we're going to start look, listening. Kevin. So do um, the skeletal muscle have the other enzymes? Um, you mean GPD-1? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the skeletal mm -hmm. muscle has both GPD-1 and GPD-1L. Mm -hmm. As do a bunch of other tissues. Mm -hmm. In this family, um, and I hope this isn't true, but I'm not sure, um, Two of the oldest people in the family who are gene carriers have come down with and one died of an ALS, an amyotrophic lateral sclerosis like syndrome. And I am somewhat concerned that the neuronal expression of this could be related to that. But it's only two, and you know, so you know, unfortunately time will tell. And fortunately, it was both in people who were well up in their 80s. Um, by the way, you know, this is a relatively benign family in the great scheme of things. There hasn't been a lot of sudden death. One of the better stories of this family is the person who has the most arrhythmias, aside from the probate, a guy who has atrial fibrillation, which is described as Brugada syndrome, on a Holter has tons of non-sustained VT. Okay. You know, we told him when we first saw him and did the Holter, he said, look, you need a defibrillator. And he said, no. And I said, well, you know, do you faint? He said, look, yeah, I faint, you know, once every couple months. I said, look, you really need a defibrillator. And he said, nope, I don't want a defibrillator. I'm happy with the way things are. And for the next 15 years, we have followed up with the family. And every time I go there, he says, Doc, I'm 78, 79, 80, 81. I still faint, and I still don't want a defibrillator. <laughs> so you never know. So anyways, uh, moving on to the second part of the talk. talk. The question is, Clearly, genetics is important in these inherited arrhythmia syndrome. But can we use genetics to learn something about sudden cardiac death, the more common types that happen in structural heart disease, and specifically to affect risk assessment of sudden cardiac death? So the idea is this. We know that the rare inherited arrhythmia syndrome, Bonn QT, Brugada, CPDT, are caused by major mutations in ion channels, ion channel related genes and that these can cause sudden death even if you have a structurally normal heart. So the question is, can more subtle genetic variants, aka things like single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, um, predispose to common arrhythmias in patients who have all other predispositions to have them, meaning who have structural heart disease, MI, low ejection fracture, heart failure. And this is potentially important. And if you look, so this is Maya Berg's figure that's, that's on this reprinted you know, millions of times, which shows arrhythmia risk versus the number of people in the United States who actually die of sudden death who fall into these categories. So there are groups with very high arrhythmia <coughs> risk, and these include patients with prior MI and ventricular tachycardia, people who are sudden death survivors, uh, people with low ejection fractions and heart failure. <coughs> but the number of people in these groups is relatively small. So these groups don't explain the vast majority of sudden death in the United States, which are in people who have no risk factors for anything, <coughs> people with coronary risk factors but nothing else, or people with known prior coronary artery disease. At the moment, we only treat with defibrillators these people, and so the vast majority of people with sudden death are not protected. And in addition, in these people, we have to put in 10 defibrillators to save one life which means that we're putting in a lot of defibrillators because we, we can't figure out within these groups who is actually likely to die. The only clinical 
um, measure we use besides aborted sudden death, and unfortunately it shows the surviving a sudden death episode ain't that great, is um, ejection fracture. So if you have a weak height, you have an indication of surgery. Um, and, not, and so the question is, can we come up with better ways to risk stratify these groups? And they really are needed. Okay, so are there genetic predictors of sudden death? Well, in favor of that, sudden death is heritable, meaning that if your, parent, if your mom or your dad died suddenly, your risk of sudden death is several fold higher than the basal population. If both your parents died of sudden death, then your risk is double digit higher than the basal than the, than the population. Still a small number, but clearly an inherited factor. And those inheritance could be through coronary disease, it could, could be through hereditary disease, it could be through anything. We know that the genes associated with electrophysiology and some of their expression levels are inherited, so it makes sense that this would be the case, and that includes um, ion channel related genes, you know, ion nervous system variant, Etc. And we also know through genome-wide association studies um, that there are variants in genes that affect intermediate phenotypes. The one that's most commonly looked at is one is QT interval. So there's a variation in QT interval in the population. We know on average that long QT is bad, and we know that there are variants in genes. The one that's most um, well known is nos 1 a p that there are variants that explain five, ten milliseconds of your QT interval. So it would make sense that those variants might be um, used for predicting risk of sudden death. Arguments against genetics being important? Well, you could say, you know, genetics not so important. It's really the environment. It's really epigenetic changes like DNA methylation or something else that really isn't specifically inherited. You could say, well, genetics is important, but the individual components is a million of them or a thousand of them, and any individual component is too small to ever see. Um, it could be small and with gene-gene interactions and gene-environmental interactions. And the problem that we ran into the other way is we don't necessarily even know which genes to look at. So to try to get at this, um, we started a study in Pittsburgh called the GRADE study, the Genetic Risk Assessment of Defibrillator Event Study. And the idea is to test whether variants in genes, ion channels, beta receptors, genes identified by GWAS studies affecting QT interval, um, predispose individuals with bad hearts and heart failure to sudden death. And the way this works is what we're going to do is we're going to enroll a couple thousand people, all of whom have bad hearts and all of whom have defibrillators. And then we're going to use appropriate defibrillator shocks for VT and VF as a surrogate for sudden death. And we're going to see if the frequency of these shocks, of shocks is a function of genetic variance in appropriate genes. So NAHLBI's uh, study, prospective five-year study started in 2003. We closed enrollment last July. Multi-center, University of Pittsburgh, Emory, Mass General, Ohio State, and our VA. Target enrollment was 1,700. We stopped at 1,850. Um, couple things. It's a biracial study. We didn't necessarily plan it that way, but that's what it turned out to be. 80% white, 20% African American, almost nothing other. The reason for that being Pittsburgh is mostly white with a small African-American population, except for the VA where it's more heavily African-American. Emory is heavily African-American, Mass General and Ohio State are heavily white. So almost no Hispanics, almost no Asians. So this, anything I'm going to show you is only relevant to African-Americans and to whites. Uh, inclusion criteria are very simple. That low ejection fraction, less than 30%, because those were the indications for defibrillators back when we started this. Um, a defibrillator, uh, some uh, not horrible heart failure, so it didn't look like you were about to die of heart failure, and able to give consent, and we excluded people if they had some other fatal disease, fatal non-cardiac disease. We did history, physical, medical record review, and EKG. Um, we took blood and made DNA from it, took blood for serum, for other potential biomarker studies, um, yearly follow-up by telephone asking, did you get shocked, among other things. And then we reviewed the ICD telemetry and adjudicated what were appropriate shocks and what weren't. And then the idea is to correlate genetic variants to the shocks. Um, primary endpoint being freedom from appropriate ICD shocks. Predefined secondary endpoints, freedom from death, freedom from death plus bad plus transplants. 
uh, so high trade endpoints and shock frequency. So, you know, when I designed this study, it was a study that looked at arrhythmias. I showed this to my heart failure colleague, and they said, no, 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 you're doing a heart failure outcome study where you're not letting people die suddenly because they don't have defibrillators. And that's another potential way of looking at the study. Uh, predetermined subgroups, ischemic versus non-ischemic myopathies, whites versus African Americans, and men and versus women. Um, and these were the genes we initially said we were going to look at, ion channel, SNPs, and sympathetic nervous system variants. And then we added in GWAS identified long QT variants. Um, this is the genetic the characteristics of the um, subjects enrolled. It was enrolled 1850. The follow up I'm going to show you is our last data lock until the one that we are currently working on, which will be ready in about a month. Um, but this, so this is as of a year ago. We had two, a little over two years follow up in a little over 1,000 uh, patients. This is a sick population. Out of these 1,000 patients, 240 have died. 60 have either had either a bad or a transplant. The, the, some got bad and then transplanted. We, those are in the transplant group. Um, so it's a pretty high event rate. The shock event rate is over 7% a year. So it, it's, it's a sick population. The death rate is equal to that. Mostly male. Why is that, you ask? Because most defibrillators are placed in men. And that's nationally true. Why is that, you ask? Good question. Um, might be because men tend to be younger when they get coronary artery disease and therefore are younger when they have heart failure. But it's a little, and it, but it's unclear whether there may be some bias in putting different devices in men. But it's really, this is nationally true. 80% uh, Caucasian, about 15 to 20% African American, mostly ischemic based on the people we put devices in, mostly class 2, average ejection fraction 22%. So a sick heart failure cohort. I'm going to just show you some general data so you get a feeling for the population for us. Um, so on the left is going to be freedom from appropriate ICD discharges. On the right is going to be survival. First slide is just as a function of age. If you're older, you're survive in your heart failure, your survival is worse than if you're younger. Makes sense. No real effective age on defibrillator shocks. Men, women, no difference in either shocks or survival. Ejection fraction, look on the right for us. In this group of low ejection fraction people, if your EF is lower, you're more likely to die than if your EF is in the higher of the group, makes sense. Shocks, a trend towards the lowest EF group having the highest number of shocks, but didn't quite reach significance as we said with a year ago. Um, etiology, no difference between ischemics and non ischemics, a trend towards ischemics doing worse in survival um, laid out. QRS duration, um, if your QRS is short, your survival is a little bit better, but no effect on defibrillator shots. QT interval, this is a little surprising, actually no effect. Now granted, this is a sick heart failure population and the QT interval does very long here and there's a lot of bundle branch blocks, et cetera. So that's probably part of why any real effect is washed out here. NYHA class, survival, the worse your NYHA class, the worse your survival. Shocks, not so much. Statistically significant, but class one and class three have the most shocks, while class two tend not to. And this may be a little bit of bias that some of the people without heart failure were more likely to get a device if they somebody thought they were at higher risk for getting a shock you know, and therefore became available to us to enter into our study. And my guess is that that's what it is. Also, although I'm not going to show it to you, there's a tendency of you to want to get shocked as you get sicker. So if you, we follow NYJ class as a function of time, and you, as your class deteriorated, you were more likely to get shocked after you became NYJ class three. This is the most unexpected clinical finding we found. So. If you're African American, you're twice as likely to get a defibrillator shock as an appropriate shock as if you're Caucasian. First thought is, well, African Americans were sicker and they were more advanced heart failure, but in fact, there's absolutely no difference in survival as a function of time. So if African Americans were sicker when they were enrolled, you wouldn't expect this. So it appears, at least in our cohort, that African Americans are more likely to get shocked here. Yeah. That second one. Mm -hmm. Only goes out to 25 months. Do they keep diverging to 50, in which case they're in Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, have, I copied the wrong slide in here. No, there's um, no difference 
um, even when you take it out to, there's still no statistically significant difference, even when you take it out to 50 months. Um, we probably only do 40 months or 50 months. When you get out here, the numbers are relatively small in the African American group. So it's, um, so it's a little bit of an issue. But no, there's no difference. Sorry about that. <coughs> so this immediately brought up the thought. So there's a variant in the sodium channel, SCN5, that's been described by Mark Keating's group, that is a weak long QT variant that is present only in African Americans and is supposed to make you at risk for arrhythmias. So our first thought was, is this a result of that sodium channel variant? And that variant is an uh, S1103Y variant in the sodium channel at region 1103. Um, minor allele frequency is 6.5% in African Americans, meaning about 13% of African Americans are heterozygous for this variant. It is um, in, a two, in a paper published by um, Mark Keating's group, they showed that in a group of people with unexplained, a group of African Americans with unexplained arrhythmias, this variant was much more common than the absence of that, than you would expect based on the population, um, with an odds ratio of almost nine. So it's basically saying that you know, this really appears to make you more likely to have an arrhythmia. And in vitro work showed a mild long QT phenotype, you know, mild, a bit of a late sodium current um, in this variant. So it's perfectly reasonable. And a second paper by another group showed that babies who died of SIDS had more representation of the YY variant than you would expect. Suggesting, so all these suggest that this is a very good candidate for it. So we went ahead and genotyped the African Americans in the group. Um, SS homozygous versus the SY heterozygous. There was one YY homozygous um, person in, in our cohort. No significant clinical differences except use of nitrates, which I don't really understand, and maybe a flu. And this is the result. So no difference in survival, but the, if you look at appropriate shocks, the SY and YY group actually has fewer appropriate shocks than the SS homozygous group. Now, this is a small cohort, so I can't tell you with these numbers that the SY plus YY cohort actually have, you know, is anti-arrhythmic. But what I can tell you <coughs> is that it clearly does not explain the twofold increased risk in shocks that we see in African Americans because the people who are getting shocked are not the people with that genotype in this population. Okay, so that's some negative data. So let's, let's move on to something that's not quite as negative. So we went ahead and looked at NOS1AP, um, protein named Capon, which is nitric oxide synthesized one adaptive protein. And this is the gene that's been associated best with QT interval by innumerable uh, GWAS studies, the p-values 10 to the minus 27 when you do a meta-analysis at this point. And it's also in at least one study been associated, the variant's been associated, or some of the variants have been associated with sudden cardiac death. Uh, mechanism's still uncertain, and nothing is specifically known about the role of this in heart failure patients. So we took, I'll show you data from one of the SNPs, and this is the one that's been best associated with sudden death in addition to QT interval. This SNP is a little more common in African Americans, if you look at, we looked for QT interval, no association at all with QT interval. Again, very small number of people with very wide QR, QT intervals and a huge dispersion of QT intervals because they have end-stage heart failure. And if you look at survival, no difference, and if you look at freedom from defibrillated discharges, you see that the GG genotype, which is the one that's associated with sudden death, is barely statistically um, significantly more likely to give you an appropriate ICD shock. And the, uh, the other SNPs were close to statistical significance that are in like the statistical equilibrium of this one. So need a little bit more data to prove that this is really true, but it's suggestive that this genotype that's associated with long QT actually does provide some arrhythmic risk. Let me finish with the best example that we have so far. And this is a beta-2 adrenergic receptor variant, a glutamine to glutamate polymorphism at position 27 of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. 
Um, we know beta receptors are important. We know beta agonists increase their rhythm. There's beta blockers protect against them. This SNP is common. The glutamine allele has a frequency of about 0.6 in Caucasians, so it's relatively common, meaning about a third would be homozygous for the glutamine, um, about a tenth homozygous for glutamate, and the rest would be heterozygous. And in a study published in circulation in 2006, <coughs> Sudodahini et al. showed in two separate populations a 60% increased risk of sudden death in glutamine 27 homozygous. One was the cardiovascular health study, which is 10,000 people followed prospectively for five years. You have a couple hundred sudden deaths. You had a 60% increased risk of sudden death if you had the glutamine um, homozygous. Of course, still very rare event. The other study they used as a confirmatory study is they took an autopsy study and showed overexpression of glutamine homozygous in dead people who died of sudden cardiac death. And Liggett's group has done a lot of work suggesting that these polymorphisms, although it's not clear exactly how important this specific one is, may offer trafficking and affect down regulation of beta receptors. So we went ahead and genotyped that group, and you can see that if you look at this age and a segment of other clinical characteristics, there's no difference between glutamine homozygous and glutamate <coughs> carriers. And this is the results of the um, shocks on the left and survival on the right. No difference in survival. The glutamine homozygous have a robust 70% increase in appropriate shock frequency compared to the glutamate um, and uh, homozygous in the, and the heterozygous group. Um, with the p value that actually and is now down in the 0.001 range. We looked at the subgroups that we said we were going to look at to see how robust it is. It's true in ischemics. It's true in non-ischemics. It doesn't reach statistical significance, but this is just a number problem. The magnitude of the side effect is the same. It's true in whites. It's true in African Americans. By the way, glutamine homozygous are more common in African Americans than they are in whites, so that's an issue. And it's so this could explain some of the increased risk of appropriate shocks in African Americans. This is one of the more interesting things we found. So this is a sick heart failure population. Most are on beta blockers. Of the 90% or so of people on beta blockers, half are on carbetamol, which is a non-selective beta blocker, and half are on lopressor, which is a beta-1 selective blocker. The effect is entirely in the group on non-selective beta blockers. And these two lines actually run right down the middle of these two lines over here, suggesting that if you selectively take out the beta-1 receptor, 